Um, all right, it's now five past one, so I believe we should start. We have quite a few participants here. Um, thank you to everyone for coming for this really exciting event, um, the Awakening of Indian Women um, this September afternoon. Um, my name is Diva Gujral and I'm an LSE Fellow in 20th Century Indian and Global Imperial History um, here at the LSE. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this really exciting um, event. I just wanted to add a little bit more about um, sort of just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, this is a recorded event um, and it is a seminar. So at the end of the event, I ask that everyone in attendance use the question and answers feature at the bottom of the screen in order to ask their questions to our exciting panelists. Um, I just wanted to introduce a little bit more about the LSE library as well. Um, this is obviously marking a new edition of The Awakening of Indian Women by Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay and others. Um, we should say that the, the women's library collection at the LSE has been looked after by the university since 2013, but it has its origins in the women's suffrage movement in the UK in 1866. The women's library collection tells the story of the campaign for women's rights and women's equality from the beginnings of the suffrage movement to the present day. The collection includes UNESCO recognized documents, rare books and objects, including a copy of The Awakening of Indian Women by Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, which was digitized for this new edition we're speaking about today. Um, without further ado, I believe I should hand over to Amina, who will be moderating this event. Thank you to everyone for being here once again and for your time uh, to our wonderful panelists. Oh, Amina, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that, Deva. Deva, thanks very much for introducing um, the event. And good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this particular panel discussion. My name is Amina Yakin, and I'm a professor of world and postcolonial literatures at the University of Exeter. And um, I work on um, women's writing myself. And um, this event and this book on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and others, The Awakening of Indian Women, published by Lurid Editions, is um, something that I am very um, excited about and looking forward to the discussion with the panelists coming from a variety of um, interests and contexts. So what we will have is a rich discussion for you and the format we'll keep to is around uh, me asking a round of questions to the panelists for um, about an hour. And there's the Q&A function that uh, Steve mentioned where you can put your questions in and we will definitely take time at the end to respond to those. So um, let me start by introducing our wonderful panelists. Uh, we have with us Professor Sumitha, Sumitha Mukherjee, who's Professor of Modern History at the University of Bristol. And her recent book is Indian Suffragettes, Female Identities and <clears throat> Transnational Methods. We have uh, Uditi Sen, who is Director of um, Liberal Arts and Associate Professor specializing in the history of South Asia at the University of Nottingham. And we have Dr. Rosalind Parr, lecturer in Modern History, Glasgow Gal Caledonian University, and author of Citizens of Everywhere, Indian Women, um, <clears throat> Nationalism, Cosmopolitanism, 1920 to 1952. Um, and I, it's, I would like to welcome all of the panelists to the session. And um, I'm giving them very short introductions. They're distinguished panelists with a vast array of um, accolades and um, specialisms behind the work that they do, which has been simplified into just one text for you to think about. So as they talk, please uh, do sort of uh, appreciate what the, the kind of contexts and backgrounds and the work that they that has gone into their contribution to today's discussion. I'd also like to thank my colleague, uh, Dr. DM Withers, who helped to curate uh, this particular panel today and to um, just 
also mention again Lurid Editions, uh, who reprint um, publications, recovering books uh, from which have kind of fallen out of circulation from in the 20th century and um, really radical books that need to be considered. And I think um, when we talk about the 20th century and we talk about women's uh, rights and we talk about uh, women in general, we take it sometimes as a given that this is something that we have. And I think this a uh, particular book is a very strong reminder for us to think about where this story, how this story starts, where it goes back to, and who were the women in, you know, what are the connections across uh, the Imperial Center, the Metropolitan Center, and the colonies at the time, and also the histories of those locations. So very much kind of going back to the specificity of um, India in this particular instance. So I'll start with my first question for Sumitha. Sumitha, can you talk about the political contexts in which the awakening of Indian women emerged? Yeah, sure, thanks. I mean, and just to say, so this book was first published in 1939 in the outbreak, or well, before the outbreak of the Second World War. I'm gonna wave my copy as well. And actually before I start to say, Thank you so much to DM Withers and Lurid Editions for reprinting this text. It's amazing to see it um, in print. It's such a, a great text. I'm really excited to talk about it today. Um, so yes, yeah, it was published in 1939 um, for the outbreak of the war. And just to give context, to many of you will be aware of this, many of you may not be so aware of this. It um, might be obvious to many of you, but India was under colonial rule at that time in the 1930s when Kamala Devi, Chopadai and others were writing this book. Um, the 1930s were a period of um, high nationalism in the Indian subcontinent. The Indian National Congress was the one of the main um, bodies campaigning for um, nationalism across the subcontinent. As long as, as long, along with um, the Muslim League, but also various other parties um, in the Indian subcontinent, and it wasn't until, you know, many of you will know this, but it wasn't until 1947 that India and Pakistan um, gained independence from the British Empire. So in the 1930s, um, you know, India um, and the writers are are speaking to and thinking about um, colonialism and the ways in which one. Um, can imagine and think about um, a new nation of, of India and also the imaginations of, of a new um, Pakistan. And while um, in the 1930s then, um, while Indians are contemplating and, and thinking about how one might wrestle away from colonialism and what a new nation might be, there's a, a rise of something which is called civil disobedience in the 1930s, where um, many people in, in the nationalist movement in India are um, engaging in forms of disobedience against the colonial state um, in order to um, to show their activism and show the ways in which they um, want to resist um, the nation state. And while um, uh, the, the, the nationalists and, and people are, are thinking about nationalism, are thinking about anti-colonialism, the position of women is something that's really important um, for, for many politicians, political activists, um, campaigners to, to think about um, how one positions women um, under colonialism and under um, a nation state, which is why um, you know, which is what kind of the 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 the, the milieu, I guess, in which this um, this text um, emerges. Um, just to give a very potted history, then of, of, um, I'm sure Ros and Iditi will say much more about this. Um, just give a little bit of potted history of some of like the women's rights activism that's going on in the 1930s in the Indian subcontinent. Um, there are two major Indian women's activist groups at this time, the All Indian Women's Conference and the Women's Indian Association. Um, there are a number of um, legal changes that are taking place in the 1930s in the Indian constitution, or in, in the laws in India. Um, Many of them are solely related to the position of Hindu women, um, and there are um, issues around um, uh, the way in which uh, women are categorised in India. But there are various laws being enacted around child marriage in 1929, around um, Hindu women's property, around um, uh, marriage and inheritance as well. Um, and 
just to say that then that people are really thinking about um, where do um, the rights of women lie um, in in face of colonial rule, in the face of imperialism, and in, in the face of um, uh, trying to imagine what a, a new nation state might be, what 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 will be the kind of political um, structures, the political rights of women um, in a new nation. So that's a kind of um, a very sketchy, sorry, um, overview of what's kind of going on in the 1930s. Just to say that people are thinking about a nation, they are thinking about colonialism, they are thinking about an anti-colonial resistance they are um they are on the, the the verge of the second world war they are they are coming towards independence although they don't know that yet um in the 1930s and they're very much thinking about the legal and political and social and economic status of women um in india at this time which is where um kamala devi chattopadhyay and others are, are are coming from and thinking about mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Sumita. You covered quite a lot there. And I was it was reminding me, you know, of, of uh, reading the book, which I read with great excitement, and enthusiasm and thinking, oh, God, all these things, you know, we're still talking about them today, as you as you were saying, you know, about uh, the enfranchisement of women, education, child marriage, further and prostitution and all the chapters, you know, that that are sort of laid out. And in a sense, as you were saying, you know, in those in that is kind of that context about uh, the milieu that it's set in in the 20th century as all of this is happening. So thank you for sort of bringing that out. Um, so my next question, I'll turn for my next question, I'll turn to Roz. And, uh, and it's a very simple question, Roz, who was Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay? Well, thanks, Amina. And can I also say congratulations to Lurid Editions for their wonderful copy of this book and also to Sumita for her wonderful introduction um, to the book, um, which I think is wonderful. So um, congratulations uh, on that. Um, Kamala Devi was many, many things. So she had this very long life. Um, she was born in 1903 uh, and she died in 1988. So that spans a huge uh, period. But I think what I'll focus on just for now is uh, who was Kamala Devi in the 1930s when she wrote this book. Um, so she writes Awakening uh, in 1939, as Samita said, and she is at this point uh, quite a prominent anti-colonial activist uh, in the Indian National Congress, um, but she's very much on the left of the uh, the Congress, and she is uh, she's a committed supporter of Gandhi. Uh, and she's very uh, committed to supporting his leadership, but she's a member of uh, by 1939 the Congress Socialist Party. So this is uh, a younger element, really, uh, mostly younger within the Indian National Congress, who is trying to push the agenda to the left. And you can see this in the text. Uh, this text is obviously written from um, a Marxist perspective. This runs through the text and this is, um, but this is who she is in terms, in the context of the Indian nationalist movement. Um, she's also a Samita, well, uh, I think Samita might have mentioned she was a member of the Indian women's movement. So she's very prominent within this. Um, she was a founder member of the All the India Women's Conference, which, which Samita mentioned. Um, and this is an organization that campaigns on all sorts of issues. Um, she was very involved in a campaign for child marriage legislation. Uh, in uh, at the end of the 1920s as part of the uh, the AIWC. Um, and so she is known, and I think she talks about this in her memoirs, for um, going to the leadership of the Indian National Congress with people like much older men like uh, Motilal Nehru and trying to convince them to throw their weight into supporting new legislation around child marriage. Um, so she she had these two roles. Um, she's been by this point. Uh, she's been very involved in the civil disobedience movement that Samita mentioned. Um, so and she's also known for sort of slightly challenging Gandhi in this context. So um, when Gandhi led the Salt March, a very famous. Um, events when he uh, marched to the sea to harvest salt Ill illegally 
Uh, no women were involved in that salt in that salt march. So Kamala Devi uh, went to go meet him on this um, uh, march and try and persuade him to, you know, carve out a role for women to tell women what the what their role is within this movement. So she is a sort of fairly disruptive figure within um, the Indian nationalist movement. Um, and she's also um, so she's she's prominent in India, but she also has this international career. So this book was written to accompany her on her travels, um, where she operated firstly as, or, uh, on the one hand, as um, a spokesperson for Indian nationalism, but also as a representative of the in Indian women's movements um, in the international women's movement. So she goes um, in 1939, she goes to Copenhagen, to be part of the uh, International Women's Suffrage Alliance Congress, big international meeting there. And I, I assume that this is, like, she would have taken this book with her to tell, uh, to, to publicize really the Indian women's movement in that context, to explain um, the Indian women's movement to her sort of international um, uh, counterparts in the uh, international women's movement. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll stop there. I think there's a lot more to be said. I haven't really introduced her um, her family background, but um, perhaps we'll, we'll stop there for now. Okay. Thank you, Ross. You've given us a lot to go on. I think um, Kamala Devi, as, as you know, the more you uh, he hear about her, the more I read about her, the more I'm interested to learn, you know, even um, kind of the things that you're talking about as well in terms of the roles and the tension uh, that they sort of bring out in terms of the Indian women's movement, which uh, has an international alliance and the project of nationalism is something that I'm sure we will be, you know, returning to and talking about because also I was, um, and, and, you know, the salt march that you drew attention to as well and the civil disobedience uh, movement in terms of how, you know, being part of those protest marches and being part of those kind of protest movements is so important for her. And then her kind of uh, connection with socialism and also that very strong need to identify, you know, labor in relation to women's participation and to kind of account for the women's participation and whether that sort of comes through in the politics is, is something that, you know, it'll be interesting to talk about further as well as we go on. Um, but uh, I'll turn, you know, for uh, the next question to Udithi and, um, and, and actually, you know, continuing that sort of uh, question, in relation to socialism and talking about uh, awakening as a Marxist feminist text, you know, two, two topics that we can talk for a very long time, right? Uh, can you talk about the influences of Marxism on the Indian feminist and independence movements of the early 20th century? Um, Odithi. It's a, um, it's a very broad question. It's a huge question. I know. It's a huge question. Uh, so, I mean, I. So, what I'm briefly going to say is that the influence of Marxism on actually the Indian feminist movement, uh, per se, was limited. And the, my reason for saying that is that, you know, the, 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 it's important for us to understand the Indian feminist movement as a multi sided, you know, project. Uh, with multiple points of origin. Uh, now, Kamala Devi is clearly located at this point of, you know, this conjuncture in the 1930s, where Gandhi gives the call of the civil disobedience movement, as, you know, Shweta talks about, you're kind of in a place where you're looking forward towards, you know, independence, the Socialist Party has been formed. Uh, so within then that context, there are two kind of contradictory motives. On one hand, we have virulently anti-communist Gandhi, who is nevertheless kind of, you know, holding up women, as the ideal kind of non-violent protesters, right? Uh, and at the same time, you have, you know, with greater influence of, you know, Russian revolution and the idea of, you know, what we can learn from this international context, inspiring some women in India 
really radically question what the role of imperialism is, what their role is. So it is kind of this very contradictory influence uh, that, you know, uh, women have to negotiate at this point of time, right? And what it really does and what we can see in Kamala Devi, in the women who are kind of more on the left, right, it enables a kind of vision a kind of understanding and a kind of, you know, analytical perspective, which is not accepted by the majority of feminist organizations, right, as their mainstream, as their main line, because they can't, they also have to, they can't break clause with county, right, they can't kind of fly their own banner and go separate, right, so there's a, there's a strategy of you keep it all together in the fight against, you know, imperialism, but within that, you know, Kamala Devi has if we read in this text, you know, in the one of the first kind of chapters where she talks about, you know, enfranchisement of women, I mean, there's a, absolutely a clear critique of, you know, how um, religion and tradition and the traditional role of women is uh, supported and held up uh, by, you know, empire, right? Uh, there's also clear understanding in her section where she talks about wages and labor, clear understanding of women as fundamentally as workers. This is not Gandhian nationalism by any means, but she doesn't break ranks with Gandhi, right? In the same breath, she'll praise Gandhi. So that is really, so in some ways, what we are looking at in terms of the women's movement here, the influence on women, which enables them to kind of develop a different kind of feminist consciousness. But if we take the same kind of, you know, lessons of Marxism, uh, it might help us as, you know, modern day feminists and particularly modern day Indian feminists, you know, like myself get over our disappointment of, you know, well, why don't they just break free of these, you know, conservative, you know, ideas and traditions and of these men? But because they can't. They don't have the economic basis uh, or the national basis or the structures, you know, uh, to break free of, you know, some of the more conservative iterations of nationalism. So I think looking at the influence of Marxism, it is vital to understand this. In some ways, if you're looking at the 30s, 40s, this is when you know, the trade union movement starts and you know, it builds up post-independence. The influence on women's rights is not necessarily positive. If we look at it in terms of its influence on actual working class women, which Kamala Devi iterates is the real India, you know, the women work. But trade union movements during this period actually are fundamentally patriarchal. And they repeatedly sacrifice, you know, the rights of, you know, women. Uh, so there's a contradiction of Marxism allowing patriarchy, of a more patriarchal nationalism allowing the flowering of, you know, a Marxist consciousness so within the women who are more middle class, right? So that is kind of what we are looking at, you know, during uh, this period. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I'm I'm going to stop here because it's a it's not it's it's not a direct kind of influence, but you can clearly see if you read this text, uh, if you look at Kamala Devi as one of these women who's inspired, you can clearly see the influence of you know what is possible in Russia, what is possible for women as workers. You 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 can you can make those connections, though she's savvy enough to not mention that. You you'll mm -hmm. never get her to own up publicly uh, mm -hmm. because then you know there are other bridges she cannot burn. Right. Uh, thank you, Aditi. That's a really, really interesting answer, and and I suppose one of the um, one of the things about middle class um, feminism and its relationship to to politics, to national politics, where those compromises are made, uh, so the critiques are embedded but they are not fully brought out because you don't want to endanger your own positionality. So I suppose, you know, the kind of follow on question that we could maybe come back to later is to what extent do you think that's a, that becomes almost embedded in the national psyche, that it becomes a, a pattern of behavior that keeps sort of perpetuating itself. So, you know, that question that you asked about why don't they break free could could also then be asked of this particular group, you know, why don't they break free? What is that kind of whole? So, and, and what you're saying is really that, you know, a lot of that lies in a text, like a, a lot of that can be understood through a text like this and how those kind of power relationships are being negotiated, but also um, 
you know, because there's so many things that you're fighting against, aren't you? You're fighting against imperialism, you're fighting against sort of religion, she's fighting against religion, she's fighting against sort of uh, myth and uh, particular ideas of femininity and masculinity, and then the violence of the colonial state, as well as, uh, you know, Gandhian nationalism, which of course ties itself very closely to uh, uh, to Hinduism or an idea of religion in itself. So I suppose what, what you're saying is that she is potentially recognizing that, but is also not going to call it out outright, but is sort of suggesting it in her prose. So that that's a really interesting um, kind of assessment of that. And uh, thank you for, for sharing that with us. And I'll... <clears throat> Uh, I guess it will. It's sort of taking me back to Sumita and um, taking, thinking about that sort of broader question about feminism. Uh, I mean, you know, I asked that totally unfair <laughs> question on Marxism and feminism to uh, the piece. So, so I'm going to kind of try to make this a little bit fairer and say, uh, bring you into the discussion as well and say Awakening is a book that aims to inform readers in Britain and America about the feminist movement in India. Um, can you talk about the transnational dimensions of the Indian feminist movement in the interwar period? Yeah, of course. Just, I mean, I think it follows on from this, some stuff that Roz and Uditi have said that um, Kana Devi is not only trying to critique um, uh, the patriarchy, I guess, and capitalism in, in its in broader sense in this text, but she um, is very much trying to write to an international audience, um, which derives from many of her own experiences um, in, a, in a broad international feminist movement, which is very vibrant in the 1920s and 30s. In the 19, 1929, she visits, i um, writing it down, uh, Berlin and um, Prague for conferences run by large international women's organisations. One is known as the International Alliance of Women and Suffrage International Alliance for Women and Suff for Suffrage and Equal Citizenship. One is the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and she goes to these conferences and she is disappointed in the in the um, Euro, Euro American centrism of international feminist movements at this time, but also the huge ignorance about Indian women. Um, she go even the Copenhagen conference that Rose mentioned in 1939, which is after this book is published. Um, she goes there and she later on. Um, is very critical of the way that all the, you know, a vast majority of women are just more interested in what she wears. They want to ask her very basic questions about her clothing and, you know, um, a kind of very um, superficial um, sociability um, in these, in the kind of the spaces that she engages with them, rather than uh, engaging in the deep political questions that she's really interested in. And in also showing, she is really keen to show that um, Indian women are engaged in these political questions. You know, it's not that those kind of intellectual questions are not the preserve of um, educated women um, in the West. Um, so there's this kind of, there's a tension here where by um, the international women at, Women's movement is is vibrant. There's lots of um, um, collaboration and exchange um, going on in the 1920s and 30s um, through conferences, through correspondence, through newspapers and periodicals. Um, for example, um, so one of the other things that Kamala Devi does um, uh, prior to this is in 1926, she's the first woman to stand for a, to contest a seat in a general election in India. Um, she's unsuccessful, but her um, election pamphlet is reproduced in uh, women's periodicals around the world, including in, in America. So there's, um, there's there are ways in which, the, uh, you know, an exchange is going on. Um, she and others are, are attending conferences and meeting um, women around the world. And yet there's still this, this barrier to understanding um, uh, what's going on in India which is why she's really keen to to publish this text for as much as for a, an Indian audience, but for international audiences as well to to recognise um, both the, the I guess the history of um, uh, imperialism in society um, and the position of Indian women in in India at the time, but also uh, the ways in which uh, they are they they're grappling, engaging engaging with issues of of work and and uh, suffrage. Um, 
uh, and labor um and so on um so yes just to say that i think that's something to to kind of recognize in in this text that it's it's both um i, I guess a riposte as well as um a, 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 an attempt to kind of open up um to to, to the rest of the world You're muted, Amna. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. That's, <clears throat> I think um, that's a really rich response um, and uh, gives us a lot to go on in terms of that question of um, feminism, you know, in India. And I think Uditi earlier said about that being a multi sided sort of um, context. And I think that's very important thing to hold on to and I, and I and I suppose I was just wondering to what extent do you think that internationalization or those kind of transnational movements do they sort of start to almost fix an Indian feminism in in that sort of context of um of a singular idea rather than a kind of plurality and that she herself is 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 um, Kamala Devi, you know, interested in that multi sightedness of it, or did you see her, her as sort of somebody who was also attracted to that singularity um, of feminism in her kind of writing? Just as a follow on, quick. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, especially in these kind of international transnational spaces. Um, very largely, and Kamala Davis is, is a part of this, you know, the All in the Women's Conference and, and so on. She, you know, she's attending these conferences as part of those groups. There is very much attempt to provide a united sense of Indian womanhood. Um, and then the, there's multiple reasons for this, the, the kind of complexities of, of, of India are perhaps too hard to translate immediately when you want to just engage and get support and, you know, you don't want to kind of... Um, you can't potentially, um, as I said, translate everything. Um, there are some perhaps um, utopian ideas as well of trying to present a universal sense of womanhood um, by many of Kamala Davies' contemporaries, which she, um, you know, sometimes buys into as well. So uh, I think you know, a lot of the the religious diversity of um, and, and caste diversity of India and class diversity of India is something that um, the, the women, Indian women more broadly, when they are in, in, na in international spaces, um, don't or aren't able to engage with. And, and Kamala is, is guilty of that as well. Um, and, you know, if you were going to critique her text as well, that she also is guilty perhaps of simplifying um, a lot, <laughs> even of, of that, uh, about Gandhi in her text. Um, so yes, um, the, the multi-sided um, heterogeneity of the Indian feminist movement is something that um, just doesn't come across in the kind of international spaces that Kamala Devi is um, working in and perhaps sometimes doesn't come across in the text either. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sumitha. That's, uh, uh, I think, something we can come back to. And I'd, I'd sort of like to put you uh, in conversation with Uditi in a, in a bit. But before that, let me uh, bring Roz into, back into the conversation as well. And um, Roz, can you talk about how awakening challenges the spatial and temporal assumptions of contemporary Western theory? Um, you know, how do you think the book might sort of give us or force through new readings and interpretations of um, feminist intellectual history, for example? Yes, um, thank you. Um, so I suppose what we're talking about here is from a contemporary feminist perspective, um, then perhaps a default or an understanding of the sort of default or hegemonic nature of feminism or the origins of feminism are, you know, that they're white and uh, Western, that there is this sort of concept of, yeah, so the origins being in a, a, a white or Western history, or um, that they, that the movement itself, even today, is 
you know, hegemonically white. Okay, so this has famously been critiqued in the 1980s um, by people like Chandra Mahanti, um, who wrote um, Under Western Eyes. Um, also people like African-American women, Kimberly Crush, K uh, Crenshaw, for example, Audrey Lord. So this has been critiqued. Um, and, you know, we now know, we now have sort of quite a developed uh, vocabulary around intersectionality, for example. Um, so one argument that I would like to pursue, and I'd be really interested to hear what others uh, have to say about this, is that the awakening, written as it was at the end of the 30s, um, potentially gives us a longer lineage of critique of white Western feminism. Um, so, you know, the context obviously is very different. We've talked about the context, the colonial context, which is different to the uh, the United States in the 1980s, for example. Um, but, you know, I think we can see a through line. Um, so in the colonial era, era, the dynamics of feminism, and uh, Smith has covered some of this, um, of international feminism, uh, mirrored these sort of, um, yeah, the dynamics of, of global inequality in terms of, um, you know, imperialism and sort of the um, European dominance. So, and this was very much reflected in the uh, uh, international women's movement, um, as Sumita was saying. Um, Br British and Western feminists talked down to uh, Indian women. Um, you know, there was this idea of... Um, yeah, these sort of younger sisters or a sort of maternalist type uh, relationship. And this is something that um, Antoinette Burton's famously written about. Um, so this is, in, in many ways, this is what Awakening is critiquing. Um, it, it's claiming for Indian women the authority that has previously been uh, claimed by Western feminists. And so it's claiming an authority um, it's asserting the expertise of Indian women and the Indian women's movement in addressing the problems of um, of Indian women. Uh, you know, it's just and just um, basically <laughs> telling Western women to you know butt out. You know, we know uh, we understand the problems in India. We have the expertise uh, to deal with it. Um, so there is that sort of assertion of expertise and authority. Um, but there is also this um, assertion of a direct lineage of feminism. Or feminism, I should mention, is is a, 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 a slightly problematic uh, in this context because women like Kamala Devi and other uh, anti-colonial women often distance themselves from the world word feminist because that was a word associated with white Western women. So. Um, you, you often hear people saying, women saying, you know, I'm not a feminist because feminism is um, anti-men. We're not anti-men. We have the support of our men um, against the colonial rule. You know, the problem here is colonial rule. Um, and I think here we're getting back to some of the questions that we've been talking about, you know, about, you know, the defence of men and, you know, how do you, uh, you know, and the, and the failure to challenge uh, men, um, in especially in this inter in, international context, um, but so in many ways, I think that yeah, this book is an example of how um, yeah, this critique of Western feminism um, is yeah is something that we can see the roots of um, much at white so white and Western feminism. We can see the roots of much earlier, and in fact, I think you know there is a direct lineage. So Chandra Mahanti, for example. Uh, writes in her writing, she she will mention she will say, "Now I have an anti-colonial uh, background. I come from an anti-colonial um, uh, background. Uh, you know, I was raised in an anti-colonial setting. So I think there is a through line, which you know, so that does challenge, um, or it gives us a new perspective, I think, on uh, ideas like intersectionality within uh, feminism." Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ros. I think the, you've you know sort of nicely drawn out the different um, uh, 
responses to the idea of uh, feminism and critical thinking that has kind of shaped it um, in the way that we encounter it today, uh, certainly in scholarship and think about kind of how, what is the relationship of for uh, Indian feminism to, uh, well, white feminism or you know, nowadays the, the context of white savior feminism, for example, comes up and different kind of how it evolves in different shapes and forms. There are, you know, plenty of examples that we could turn to. And I suppose for me, uh, one of the questions that sort of was going through my head and uh, listening to you and also thinking about the kind of text is that tension in the book with regards to, and, and I think she's conscious about it and, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, that, that sort of, of the project of modernity itself and uh, the idea of, you know, the project of Western modernity and ed women's education and attainment and in relation to that progress, you know, the measurement of progress and what is progress in the League of Nations, then if you don't kind of reach that level or are defined in that particular way. So I think she she recognises that, but at the same time, she's also drawn to it in, in the same kind of way in, in terms of a change from what there is. And so I just wondered whether you sort of thought that tension was there in her work and what you thought her relationship to, for example, women's education and literacy was in relation to that, because that's a big colonial project, isn't it? And, and you mentioned Antoinette Burton's work and um, which also kind of draws attention to that. And one of the things that the colonial state is very interested in is is those is that sort of women's question, because it's also then connected uh, to the wider relation, you know, relationship of gender, you know, and how that sort of is is not just a straightforward male female kind of division as you say masculine feminine division it, it becomes you know where, where the kind of uh, colonized male figure is feminized in certain ways as well so there are those kind of things that you were talking about I think in what you were saying anyway but I just wondered I think going back to the question I was thinking of was that question of modernity and education and women's education in particular uh what whether you had any kind of reflections on what Kamala Devi says about that in her work. Yes, I mean, I think there definitely is a tension there, um, as you identify. Um, I'm not sure if Kamala Devi is aware of it, or um, so she perhaps she is aware of it. She covers it off by saying, um, you know, this isn't a Western modernity we're after, we're after, you know, you know, there's nothing to say that India wouldn't have reached its own modernity had, um, you know, had colonial rule not happened. So this is her claim. You know, we, you know, there's nothing distinctly Western about um, modernity. You know, we, because of, you know, she's following this sort of mass Marxist determinism. Um, so, you know, if left to her own devices, then India, you know, would have got to modernity. Um, on its own. That's that's her argument. Um, and in fact, she also says more than that, colonialism uh, and this kind of Western intrusion is actually inhibiting modernity in uh, in India because, um, you know, it's it's the colonial state that's inhibiting the reform of, um, yes, of, yeah, well, um, institutions that disadvantage women. So that's her argument. But, you know, there is a tension and that's the way that she um, resolves it. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's really useful. And I was kind of, I suppose, uh, just to kind of add to that was the Margaret Cousins piece as well, which is part of the book, because I think that's where you get that slight, um, certainly I got that sort of idea you know that this is where you you would kind of pick that up now when we read that now that there's this is something that is very much in favor of Indian feminism but there's also kind of a, a patronage here that is quite complicated to unpack and and to think about um but anyway I'll I'll sort of uh turn to Uditi and and um ask you again a big question 
how were the political ideas articulated in the awakening um, um, put into action after India became independent, which is quite a vast question. So you might just want I, to talk about it. In... I, I seem to have drawn the big question straw. <laughs> you, you have to. Which is fine. Uh, so, uh, no, um, I, I will take that question. But before that, I cannot resist just, you know, adding on to what, you know, uh, Ross said and just kind of in Kamala Devi's words, uh, there's this clear pushback where she says, little do those who think that the emancipation of the Indian women began with the coming of the British, clearly speaking to international feminists, realize how successfully imperialism propped up our dying society and gave a fresh lease of life to obsolete old traditions and customs under the guise of religious neutrality and sought to perpetuate their slavery. Now, this is, you know, this is not just, you know, uh, in any means, I'm in quite understanding. Like, you know, I was quite blown away by reading this because it takes several decades for feminist scholars to fully come to terms with this contradiction, right? And and we find the full articulation of this in kind of Sangari and Vaid's, you know, recasting women of this kind of this contradiction between, you know, nationalism versus, you know, Western culture and where do women find themselves in that? And in, in, this, in this two or three sentences, if you unpack it, uh, you have, you know, it laid out. So, you know, I'll go on to the question, but what struck me about this is that, of course, this is not, you know, we might read this as scholars, it's not an academic text, this is not a scholarly text, but this is a very, very sharp intellect, uh, which is using kind of classic kind of Marxist, you know, deterministic uh, analysis, but uh, nevertheless, the critique of religious neutrality, is the one who is, you know, the culprit, it takes decades scholarship to catch up with that and I was very very you know struck by that that in her writing anyway so kind of moving on to kind of my own question uh, which is on um uh so how were the political ideas you know articulated in this uh, taken up during uh, after independence I mean interestingly the political ideas articulated in this you know one of the big ones is you know this kind of pushback this kind of you know India would have developed her own kind of liberation anyway or what holds back enfranchisement of women. We've already talked about that at length. Uh, so I would not kind of go into that. But the two other big ideas articulated here is, you know, women as workers. The fact that that ultimately women's liberation is linked to her economic liberation, right? And, you know, they, they need kind of, you know, equality in the workplace, they need equality in wages. That's one of the big ideas, you know, running through this text. Uh, and the other kind of uh, big idea of, you know, what is really holding back women is, uh, section where she puts together, like, you know, women's uh, motherhood and kind of, you know, family planning. And so these are the two kind of, you know, big ideas. And if we look at these and if we look at that context, during the same period, actually 1939, and it's published around 1940, uh, there's this text being prepared called Women's Role in the Plan Economy. Uh, and uh, it is being prepared, it's commissioned by the Congress, Women use this opportunity to pretty much put forward a radical manifesto, which includes, you know, women being paid for housework, which includes, you know, complete equality in law, which includes getting rid of family as an economic unit altogether, uh, equal wages. So it's a it's a pretty radical document that they put forward, which is then very neatly buried from 1946-47, right? So in terms of what happens post-independence is that uh, what has usually been seen that what happens post-independence is that women do get, you know, universal adult, you know, suffrage without really fighting for it in a way a lot of Western feminist contexts have had to fight for it, right? So Indian feminists, Indian women did not have to fight their own government uh, for women to be included in universal adult franchise, right? And there is, you know, only Chani's work, which looks at, you know, where, you know, the first election commissioner, uh, Shen, who's not even a feminist by any means, hasn't really engaged with this, goes to great lengths to ensure that not that just everybody can vote, but all women can vote. Uh, and there are ideas of, you know, we need to change the law so that, you know, 
women who just give their names as so-and-so's wife are not disqualified. This is seen as an outrage that they're disqualified. So there's something quite unique about this feminist context coming out of, you know, anti-colonial nationalism. This consensus is reached that, of course, women vote, you know, and, you know, and you find ways to gender the rules and regulations so that they can vote. But they're also firmly put back in the family when it comes to economy. The post-independence in all the kind of, you know, uh, five-year plans uh, women are very clearly, you know, the first five-year plan simply states that, you know, the woman should be able to fulfill her role in the family. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, can't be all over, minus some of the positive features of, you know, Indian nationalism. Um, but it, and then the later plans also really make kind of no real, you know, provisions. The way it is put into action around family planning is by other women. So, you know, these women who are active don't suddenly stop post-independence, right? Uh, Kamala Devi has a very interesting trajectory where she goes off into kind of looking at handicrafts, which is kind of, you almost, which is, I think, what Ross was gesturing at, that she was many things at many points of time. Uh, but the whole idea on family planning is kind of really, really taken up in a big way. And this is when we realize that what the new um, overarching context is, which kind of then frames all possible liberation, which is national development, um, which sadly is also colored by this whole idea that we have to catch up with the West, which is, you know, the bane of all ex-colonial societies, right? Uh, so the so nas national development becomes the overarching feature. And within that, you know, family planning is subtraction because middle class women are able to present, you know, family planning, not just as women's rights and something which liberates women, which was what was there in 30s and even early 40s and in Kamala Devi's text, post-independence, it also becomes something which is holding back national development. There's a little bit of continuity because previously it was holding back the race and, you know, there was this eugenic ideas. So there's, we can see some continuity there. That's what it becomes. So that kind of tells you what the dynamic is. But interestingly, it is post-independence where some of these dreams of modernity sought to be implemented by women, often middle-class women, middle-class women actually start encountering in a larger and larger scale the other women, the real Indian women, you know, the working poor. And then they start facing pushback. Like their ideas of liberation are not necessarily the pattern of liberation, especially, for example, on family planning, the pattern of liberation that, you know, women are looking for. So I think what happens is like a mixture. Some of it is buried. Some of it is taken forward, the context changes, and a really interesting dynamic is now unleashed, uh, you know, across, you know, class and caste interaction, uh, where, you know, so what I would guard against is, which is common in the literature, that the 50s and 60s are sort of seen as the dead decades of Indian feminism. Uh, what it is really is this period of churn, this period of this encounter and of this reframing, uh, which allows for, you know, eventual resurgence, you know, coming in the 70s. Uh, but it, it leads to kind of a complex art burial, art implementation, and a kind of, you know, different kinds of encounters. So I'm not sure if it answers the question. I think you're still muted. Um, um, Sorry, as chair, I should know better. Uh, thank you so much. That's really answered a lot of questions well questions and also raise uh, made many points that I'm sure other panelists might want to come um back on and I think I was struck by what, what you were saying about um about that thing about you know the right to vote almost comes with the territory of becoming a new nation you know that that's in the anti-colonial kind of struggle that that becomes part of the process for women's um, emancipation. But it's like you said, after, you know, the, in the post-national period that we see a kind of a change and a shift in terms of how that becomes structured more, you know, the, the kind of conversations, as you said, shifts more towards kind of family and values and um, the kind of morality of being a woman. And I think that chapter on labor and motherhood in the book is is a really interesting one because I was thinking about all that you know, I suppose what is like Kamala Devi is at the end of the book a spokeswoman for the Congress party 
uh, from what I understand of reading this book. And I was thinking, you know, what is it like in um, contemporary politics where populism is able to speak more to the kinds of um, voters that this project, you know, that Kamala Devi is talking about at that time was um, able to bypass in many ways, you know, that they, they weren't confronted with it at that time, but things seem to have evolved um, in a very different shape and form. And as you said, maybe, you know, it is that certain period, certain things get buried and they don't get picked up and, and sort of so uh, some things get highlighted more than others. And um and I think that sort of image of Mother India, I was thinking, is is something that is, you know, becomes part of the woman question in um, Indian nationalism. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong. That sort of something that sort of becomes very central to to the project um, of um, of I suppose the politicization of women after or post partition post kind of independence um so so i mean it's it's just a comment really on what you said to add to what you've said and um and i would just like to see if any of the others uh, sumitha ros if you had anything that you wanted to um pick up on from what um Uditi said just now and to talk about that sort of political ideas that come out of this book and how, you know, they um, are relevant to or not to the kind of current political context. Because the, the kind of canvas was quite wide in terms of after India became independent, but you might want to pick a specific point that you think is is kind of important for you in relation to this book. So, Sumita, shall we start with you? <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I don't know if I can pick a certain point in post-independent India or, or Pakistan, but I think um, just, I, I guess, a reflection on this conversation, uh, I think is really interesting, um, the, the points have all been raised. Um, but I think, as you've all kind of been saying, and I, you know, I say in the direction, well, you know, this is it's a critique of imperialism, I'm sure. Um, and you know the, the 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 kind of woman question is bound up with Mother India and and so on. But I mean, there is also I don't want us to kind of think that the Indian women were not also challenging you know Indian men at all in this period either. I don't, I'm not saying that anyone said that, but you know, I don't think we should, we should kind of think it's not happening at all. That you know that there are women who are campaigning for the vote in the 30s and 40s and 20s. There are you know there are challenges to um very conservative traditional men as well as challenges within um the congress party and the muslim league and so on um but yeah i guess just to kind of i wish i guess what would you say that there's almost um i don't know yeah a burial of some of those those challenges in, in the kind of post-independence era where some of that is forgotten because of this new um both because of the kind of five-year plans and all the kind of the planning and um uh the way in which congress you know takes over and has a kind of a new nationalist project um and, and also because uh you know how other issues kind of come to the fore once imperialism is no longer i guess the, the major issue of um that kind of trumps all the other um challenges um but yes you know i think the, the bigger takeaway from this as as i've said uh that this is you know a text that is um maybe ahead of its time is the wrong way to put it but you know is, is speaking to to um ideas that um are still relevant today were relevant in the 70s and 80s and 90s um, and I think that's that's the vibrancy of the text, and that's why it's you know so great that it's been republished because it not only speaks to historians who are interested in the thirties, but also to um, broader questions of um, of imperialism, of of, of women's um, activism, um, and also the post colonial um, state. I think in India and Pakistan as well, really well. Thank you, uh, Sumitha. How about you, Roz? What 
Did you have sort of some thoughts as well on that? Um, well, first of all, I, I would agree with everything that Amita just said. Um, and I think in terms of yeah, the pushback, I think in, of Indian women within this context, it is the women's organisations that are pushing the agenda at this point on women's issues, on the women question. So there are... Um, roots in sort of the history of social reform when it was more men sort of taking the initiative. But I think by this point, it really is the women's organisations. And just on the question of uh, suffrage, then, OK, so uh, the Congress adopted uh, universal adult suffrage as a policy in uh, 1931, I think. Um, but before that, it had been women who had been pushing for, for the women's franchise as, as uh, both of uh, the other panelists well know. Um, so yeah, I think that's an, it is important to make that. And, and as I mentioned before, um, on the question of child marriage, it's the women's organisations that are pushing men to adopt uh, this as a policy as well. So um, I think that's a really important point. Um, and also to agree with Smita's idea of this being a period of like real contestation, like the, the, it is such a vibrant um uh, moment in terms of political ideas. So um, Manu Goswami talks about this um, amazing article, I love it, on um, possible futures of the 1930s. And this is where we're at when we're looking at these kind of texts. It's like it's imagining the future and it's taking on, yeah, sort of lots of influences, lots of globally circulating ideas and also some Indian influences and, you know, creating a possible future. Um, so that is one of the things about this text. Um, but in terms of what the possible future turned out to be, um, yeah, obviously it, it wasn't what um, what is imagined in, in this context. Um, I suppose one thing that we haven't mentioned at all, which uh, I thought I might just bring up just to throw in another um, dimension to uh, the text is, you know, obviously this was, or as we mentioned, this was something that was intended for an international audience. Um, and after visiting Europe, we mentioned the Copenhagen conference, she then goes to America um, and she's uh, yeah, promoting Indian nationalism. This is during the war, this is wars on by now, this is my, uh, September onwards in 1939. Um, and she makes connections with African-American organizations. So there's a sort of sense of solidarity uh, with African-American organizations. And then after independence, she um, is sympathetic with this um, sort of Afro-Asian solidarity movement. So um, she's she's many things, as, as Uditi said. Um, one of the things that she is is a, a journalist in this post-independence period. So she she visits places like, yeah, Eritrea, I think I, I saw her writing about Eritrean independence. And um, so, so she's promoting this idea of um, solidarity, so transnational solidarity, particularly from the perspective of what we now call the Global South. So I think that's, um, yeah, one uh, legacy that we could uh, talk about. And you're on mute again. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I think, and it sort of uh, uh, is, is echoes, you know, um, what's said on the back cover of the book in terms of Kamala Devi's um, awakening of Indian women being radical and visionary, and a book that deserves to be on feminist reading lists and in uh, the wider transnational feminist imagination, just kind of for the reasons that you just mentioned. So I think there are some questions um, or comments coming up on the q and I'll give people a couple more minutes if they want to um, get more questions up and um, our panellists are happy to answer them live. We've got a bit more time to uh, go through them. And um, and sort of before I turn to them, uh, the team, would you like to have the last word on the kind of discussion that we've been having in terms of um, Kamala Devi's uh, positioning within um, the kind of context of um, uh, 
feminism, Indian feminism, and also, you know, returning to that point you made at the, at the sort of in the first stage of the conversation about the multi-sidedness of Indian feminisms, where where do you think this work sits? Um, in terms of, um, so if we kind of keep the focus on Kamala Devi, I mean, she is actually, she's not the only Indian feminist who went international uh, by any means. But if anything, you know, Sarojini Naidu is, you know, better known uh, as somebody who kind of went international, right? Uh, but she is by far my more kind of favorite Indian feminist. Uh, so kind of speak of that multi-sidedness, uh, she, because she is a much more radical figure in many ways. And what makes her radical is not just, you know, her, her Marxist understanding of the world, which enables her to call out imperialism, which enables her to make, you know, working women's work, not, you know, uh, you know, the cultural kind of, you know, markers of, you know, advancement of women as, you know, central to feminism, but also, you know, what uh, Ross mentioned about, you know, the solidarity, uh, which she kind of then goes on to kind of then, uh, develop with, you know, uh, the movement uh, for, you know, civil rights, for black liberation, you know, it, it, it's an incredible, I mean, in some ways, I would say that, you know, the, the, this text captures a moment in her life, it captures a moment in kind of you know in her life in conjunction with a moment in uh, or, or or a massive moment a conjuncture in kind of Indian feminist movement right and there's more to it which evolves after that and there's more that comes before in terms of you know what comes before and this is to kind of you know to pick up on the other thread that you know I think I might have inadvertently suggested that you know that um Indian feminists were not kind of, you know, fighting against men. The, the absolute kind of, you know, weight of conservatism and patriarchy and tradition which they were up against was massive, which is precisely why they couldn't afford to burn their bridges with those handful, a minority handful of nationalist men who were not half as radical as they were very often, but nevertheless could be allies. You know, so this is the context. This is not to suggest that just these men were kind of paving the way, and you know, Indian feminists somehow had it easy. Uh, so they they actually had, and the fight was indeed kind of you know led by them. Uh, in terms of you know multi sidedness, what what is interesting is that you know if we actually look at the self articulation of a lot of Indian feminists during this period or an earlier period. We often do not get a sense of, you know, the, the legacies they are building on. Whether it is on the legacies of social reform or whether it is on the legacies of, you know, uh, like kind of, you know, a lot of kind of disjointed threads that, you know, how educational reform can also be radical. For example, back in the 1890s, if you look at the word of work of Tavitri Bai Fule or, you know, Jyoti Bai Fule, this is radical. It's a radical feminist dance. It is it kind of merges uh, feminism with kind of critique of past. Uh, it is intersectional before the word intersectionality has been invented, right? And this is still kind of not even in the 20th century. Now, this then has its impact on kind of feminists who are coming out of the context of Maharashtra, which they may or may not be aware of, you know, because, you know, they might be aware of, you know, having read some of them. So, so I think, you know, so the multi-sidedness actually works to the advantage of the feminist movement in India. There are texts circulating, there are ideas circulating, there are, there are previous kind of inspirations which they draw upon erratically, which often don't get captured. So I think the full story is much larger. Uh, and yes, of course, you know, we need to acknowledge kind of, you know, the international dimension of the 1930s uh, and, you know, the, the Marxist dimension also of the 1930s, which, which is uh, huge for that moment. But that is, that is one moment. Right. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were other moments before that and other moments after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a you know very good point to keep in mind the 1930s, you know, and, and the fact that we think we we know everything we need to know about the 1930s, but a book like this opens up more things that we don't know. So it's um and and you know, as you've pointed out, like things that we need to know more of, or more people that we need to know more of, like Kamala Devi, that there are many things happening in that. 
period, as we know, but not all of, you know, we're not always kind of familiar with all of the contexts and uh, publications. So a publication like this, you know, makes it um, possible for, for us to kind of revisit that period and to listen to the work that all of you are doing, which is so exciting and so important in terms of, um, you know, generating this discussion and enriching it through kind of historical knowledge and those contexts uh, that you've all discussed. So